Hi, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. The Democratic debates part duh, delivered on expectations with Democrats dropping one-liners left and right while simultaneously eating their own. Everyone tried to take a bite out of Biden, and let me tell you, sometimes those bites were juicy. We're about to hit you with our scintillating analysis, but before we do that, we'd like to put out a little homage to those candidates that didn't qualify for the second debate. Tom Steyer. Mike Gravel, Seth Moulton, Tom Steyer, Wayne Messam. And now to the debate. Performance here was critical, as in order to qualify for the third debate, the Democratic candidates have to have at least 2% in the polls and 130,000 individual donors. Once again, we rate the candidates from worst to best performance. 20th place, Bill de Blasio. Every time he's on stage, he just reminds you how completely unlikable he is. I'm not one of those people that's in the camp where you feel like you have to have a beer with the guy or girl that's running for president, but I think it's helpful if you don't want to throw your beer at that person, then order another beer, and then throw that beer also. His best moment was probably calling out Biden for Obama's very aggressive deportation statistic, but that's a really bad best moment. 19th place, Beto O'Rourke. O'Rourke needed to have a good debate to stay relevant. Unfortunately for him, he once again delivered a lifeless performance. And the platitudes that worked well for him in his losing bid for the Senate are not playing well on the national stage. Standing next to intellectuals like Warren and Buttigieg, or even the impassioned Sanders, just made him look, well, boring. While his numbers already have him qualified for the next two debates, the direction he seems to be heading at best is as a VP candidate for whoever actually gets the presidential nod in the hopes that he'll be able to possibly turn Texas blue. In 18th place, John Hickenlooper. He was there. He didn't do anything good or bad that I can remember. But I'd like to once again reiterate that I don't think you can get a presidential nod with a name like Hickenlooper. In 17th place, Tim Ryan. He's against universal health care. The top candidates didn't like that. He was totally reasonable, but he looks like a standard issue white heterosexual male, and that's not what the Democratic Party is looking for in this election. In 16th place, Kirsten Gillibrand. She tried to hit Biden on comments that he made in 1983. He was ready for it, and she failed badly. She's going to need something a little more than men bad, women good, if she wants to continue. I don't think we're going to see her in the third debate. In 15th place, Michael Bennett. I don't really remember what he said, but I also find him to be extremely punchable, so 15th felt about right. In 14th place, Jay Inslee. Jay Inslee's big moments were taking shots at Joe Biden for climate change and calling out President Trump as a white nationalist. He got wrapped up in his talking points, however, and didn't really get into any policy or anything really substantial. Biden said he planned to get the United States off of coal and gas by removing subsidies for those industries, and Inslee said it won't work. Why won't it work? Because the house is on fire and it's too late. And then basically went on to say he would do the same things that Biden would do. I like it though, it's a good strategy. Just repeat the things that other candidates say that you like and pretend you made them up yourself. In 13th place, Kamala Harris. Harris did not have a good night, and this was in sharp contrast to her dominant performance last time. Last time, Harris was on the attack, and she really differentiated herself and showed that she was ready to take on Trump. This time, likely because she was beginning to emerge as one of the leaders in this race, she got attacked. And the results were not pretty, but the assailant was. Tulsi Gabbard outlined a host of actions that Harris took while a prosecutor, including blocking DNA evidence from a person that was on death row that could have exonerated him. Were Gabbard's statements true? It was kind of a mixed bag. Some were spot on. Some lacked context. Some were in a gray area. Whether the assertions are completely true or not, 
They were so effective that this clip has played essentially on an infinite loop since Thursday. And people are now calling Gabbard a Russian plant. There's also a certain sweetness to these attacks. As the last debate, Harris tried to dredge up some grossly out of context attacks on Vice President Biden. Turnabout is fair play. She's going to need a much better performance next time or she risks falling into VP candidate territory. In 12th place, Amy Klobuchar. She maintained her role as one of the strong moderate voices in this debate. She's also already qualified for the third debate and she certainly appears competent. However, she's yet to inspire or really differentiate herself in a way that gets anybody fired up. I kind of think of her as the control group. If you're below her in the standings, you're not going to be our next president. If you're above her, things are looking better. In 11th place, Steve the Silver Bullock. I don't remember much of Steve from the first debate, but this time he came out firing, placing himself as the kind of person that can win in a Republican state, but can also reach across the aisle to work with Republicans. He straight up said that the plans of Warren and Sanders are not grounded in reality and referred to them as wish list economics. And he did it all while maintaining a smile on his face. It was a solid performance and he was memorable, if not entirely endearing. In 10th place, John Delaney. Yeah, Warren dunked on him a little bit, but he still had a good showing. Delaney didn't back down under any attacks and showed himself to be a practical moderate in a sea of progressive opinions. He favors a measured approach to public health care by creating a Medicare for all plan, but also allowing people who want to keep their private health insurance to do so. Frankly, I don't understand why that was considered an extreme position for the people on stage. He didn't ace this debate, but now most people will remember him, which he absolutely needed if he wants to go further. Ninth place, Julian Castro. Castro got a lot of airtime and he looked good on television. He pushed back hard on those that equate reducing crossing the border illegally to a misdemeanor as having an open border system. He did this even though that was specifically the argument that the Obama administration had for not reducing it to a misdemeanor. The problem is this seems to be his one trick pony. We believe that if he's going to qualify for the third debate, he's going to need something more than this position. While many in the Democratic Party and Republican Party are not happy with the president's border policies, there's a vast difference between advocating for humane treatment and putting policies in place that are actually going to probably increase illegal migration. Castro is likely asking the electorate to go a bridge too far. In eighth place, Cory Booker. Senator Booker is getting the nod from a lot of people in the same way that a tough boxer gets the nod for losing a round but not losing it as badly as he might have. During the debate, he stated that Democrats lost Michigan to Trump specifically because Russians targeted minority voters. This statement was later shot down by Democratic fact checkers. Booker then went head to head with Biden on their career records, stating that Biden was dipping into the Kool-Aid without knowing the flavor. I don't even know what that means. He added some humor and some catchy lines and a lot of politicos were extremely happy with his fire and polish but we don't think he did anything to improve his position and I doubt very much that the polls are going to move one way or the other. His worst moment was questioning why Democrats were pitted against each other during a debate to be presidential candidate. That's kind of what you do in a debate, isn't it? In seventh place, Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard came out swinging against Kamala Harris, challenging her record as a prosecutor. She went after her for many things, including DNA evidence. And that's all I have to say about that. In sixth place, Pete Buttigieg. Pete had some fine moments, but didn't stick the landing the way he did in the first debate. His explanations were at times a little too consultant preachy. He also made a lot of his independent and moderate fans uncomfortable when he started talking about packing the Supreme Court, eliminating the Electoral College, and making DC a state. Nevertheless, he had a really strong performance, once again showing that he has a strong intellect and a really calm disposition. But I don't think he advanced his position the way he did in the first debate. He'll need to do better if he's gonna supplant any of the top four. In fifth place, Andrew Yang. Are there holes in his game? Absolutely. But Yang didn't sell out, and he's garnering almost 2% of all polls, despite the fact that CNN didn't really want to ask him any questions or let him say anything. He made a lot of fans when he attacked the entire concept of the evening when he stated, instead of talking about automation in our future, including the fact 
that we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs, hundreds of thousands right here in Michigan. We're up here with makeup on our faces and our rehearsed attack lines playing roles in this reality TV show. It's one reason why we elected a reality TV star as our president. His growing popularity seems to be making the Democratic intelligentsia nervous. While Yang reported over 2% in four polls, which would allow him to come to the third debate, the DNC decided to discount one of them because two of the four polls came from NBC. He did all that he could with the time allotted, and we hope he gets to come back for the third poll, if for no other reason that he's the only person talking about the impact that automation is actually gonna have on our economy, while everyone else is pretending that we're gonna actually bring manufacturing jobs back to the United States in any measurable way. In fourth place, Vice President Joe Biden. Vice President Biden gave a sound, if not exemplary performance. The good news for him, he didn't have to. He didn't get beaten up the way he did last time, where we think he expected them to give the elder statesmen a little leeway. He struck a good balance, being very well prepared with opposition research, while at the same time not going incredibly dark and destroying his Democratic opponents. He played it safe, didn't add any gaffes, and remains the leader to win it all. In third place, Marianne Williamson. Does she know policy? No. Does she think removing negative energies can cure diseases? Yes, she does. Does she appear to be on acid at all times? Possibly. Nevertheless, in the same way that Trump was in the last election, she's becoming a media darling. People are contributing to her campaign just to see what will happen next. On the one hand, I love hearing about how space energy and crystals can combine to defeat Trump. On the other hand, I have absolutely no faith in the voting body, and I worry that the more times she comes on stage, she may end up being president. In second place, Bernie Sanders. Sanders came out firing and made sure that this time around, everyone felt the burn. When he was attacked for his healthcare plan by John Delaney and replied with a curmudgeonly, you're wrong, he received a ton of applause. In general terms, he showed that he was sick and tired of the establishment and was ready to break away from other Democrats if necessary, which many progressives in the party endorse. He badly wants this fight with Trump and he knows that this is probably his last chance at the presidency. He fought hard and reminded everybody that he isn't done yet. He, like Warren and Harris, not only believes that public health care is a must, but also believes that private health insurance needs to be eliminated altogether. That's where many have a major problem with it. Many Western countries have public health care, but even the most progressive allow private health insurance for those who want it. The goal in outlawing the practice is twofold. The first is to increase government, and that might be a reasonable concern. The second is to remove any options for doctors that do not want to serve public health care. In my opinion, it's an extremely un-American view and goes far beyond what many are claiming is democratic socialism and moves to complete socialism. The government controls the means of production and there is no other option for doctors. I think it's a bridge too far for most Americans, including Democrats. There's literally no good and fair reason to completely eliminate private insurance, even if you believe passionately in universal health care. And finally, in first place, Elizabeth Warren. Warren had a great debate. Her best line of the night was when she responded to Delaney with the question, I don't even know why people bother to run for president if they want to do everything like it's always been done. She was well prepared, had strong intellectual answers for everything she was asked, and showed that she was ready for a fight, especially with this president. I think a lot of Democrats really want to see that fight in particular, but are a little worried that she's not going to be able to pull over swing states. Her one miss of the night, in my opinion, is when she was repeatedly asked if they would raise taxes on the middle class in order to pay for universal health care, and she continued to repeat the concept that it's going to lower costs. By not answering the question, she kind of put herself in a corner. They will have to raise taxes. If she believes this is the right plan, she needs to just own it. Otherwise, it's always going to seem like she's trying to hide something or pull one over on the electorate. And that's enough of the debates. Let's move on to the rest of the news. This week, the Senate blew the top off the spending cap, setting new spending levels and boosted the nation's borrowing authority. The legislation extends out two years and allows for $1.3 trillion in discretionary spending for defense and domestic programs. It passed with votes on both sides of the aisle with a count of 67 to 28. 
Trump praised the bill, as did a number of senators. Many who opposed the bill said that future generations will be burdened with this decision. Senator Rand Paul stated that this is the most fiscally irresponsible the U.S. government has ever been. President Trump announced Thursday that he's slapping China with some more tariffs. Trump pointed to China stealing intellectual property, not opening up its markets to the United States, and subsidizing its companies to give them an unfair advantage. With this news, the U.S. stock index closed down about 1% and the Dow lost 280 points. People are shuffling their money into larger, more stable companies that the tariffs are less likely to affect. Trump has tried to keep his comments positive, saying he looks forward to a new comprehensive trade deal. In the meantime, however, we plan to tax the bejesus out of them. This doesn't only affect China, however, as the United States consumer is going to feel the sting at Walmart. Which is fine, I'm sick of paying too little anyways. Let's bring back VCR repairmen. In breaking super important news, ASAP Rocky has been released from Swedish prison. He is set to be sentenced August 14th, but is allowed to go home should he choose to do so. Trump tweeted for ASAP to get home ASAP, and there was much rejoicing. And there was much rejoicing. This week, the governor of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rizzello, announced that he would resign today at 5 p.m. If you're not up on the situation, much of Puerto Rico has been clashing with police in protest demanding his resignation over a group chat scandal. Rizzello and his inner circle were caught making scandalous remarks about people of different sexual orientation and especially the Hurricane Maria victims. The aptly named Chatgate set off frenzied outrage from the public. So today, Rizzello will step down. He has made Pedro Pierluisi his successor by making him Secretary of State. But it's not a done deal. This leaves Puerto Rico in a bit of a bind, as they may not have a governor once Rizzello steps down. With that said, I'd like to formally nominate Jorge Rivera for interim governor of Puerto Rico. 31-year-old Centoya Brown is set to walk out of prison August 7th as a free woman. She was convicted of killing a man in Nashville as a sex slave when she was sold into slavery at the age of 16. Prosecutors argued that because she took the man's wallet after killing him that it was armed robbery and not self-defense. Those prosecutors are stupid heads. The convictions both carried life sentences. The story gained national attention after A-list celebrities like Rihanna took to Twitter with it. It eventually reached the ear of former Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam, who granted Centoya clemency eight months ago. While in prison, she earned her college degree and plans to open up a nonprofit to help troubled youths. To what? What? Did you say youths? Yeah, two youths. What is a youth? Oh. Excuse me, y'all. Two youths. Oh, hey, I forgot to mention something. The United States just threw away a 31-year-old treaty with the Russians over, you know, nukes. This treaty was set up by Reagan and Gorbachev, banning the use and creation of short to mid-range nuclear weapons launched from a ground platform. The good news this time is that most people are pointing the finger at the Russians and not America for this deal falling apart. The consensus is that this treaty did nothing for the United States and its allies but prevent them from protecting themselves while Russia continued to illegally invest in these same munitions. A series of non-compliance complaints were aimed at Russia and it gave them six months to come into compliance, which they completely ignored. So the United States decided to walk away from the treaty and start testing our own ballistic missiles. This is an obvious flex back at the Russians and the world is once again lamenting the beginning of what could be the next Cold War. Trump weighed in saying that he hoped that the United States and Russia and possibly China as well could reach a peaceful resolution. Nevertheless, he admitted that Russia is putting us in a bad place. In unrelated news, House Democrats have stated that a majority of them now want to begin impeachment proceedings against President Trump. The Pentagon recently put a full stop on awarding a contract to one of four companies. This contract would move Pentagon operations into the cloud data space. Really? What could possibly go wrong? The project is called JEDI, or Joint Enterprise Defense Infrastructure. Amazon, IBM, Oracle, and Microsoft are all contract finalists for the Pentagon contract. And this contract is a $10 billion contract. Amazon was set to be announced as the winner, although IBM and Oracle sued to block the contest, stating that it was rigged, saying that Amazon was in cahoots with the Pentagon because some Pentagon employees had previously helped them with other projects. After hearing about these complaints, Donald Trump weighed in, and now the entire selection process is under review. This is probably not even a bad thing. But really, we're just waiting to inevitably see every U.S. strategic operation on TMZ after the Pentagon gets hacked by 4chan. 
especially when some congressperson uses their personal computer to send and receive files. It's like leaked operational nudes. And finally, in Florida Man news, a Florida man broke into a house, took a shower, and then sat nude on the front porch until police arrived. 31-year-old Brian Mundy walked into the back door of their home, grabbed a Gatorade from the fridge, and then took a nice, luxurious shower. The thing I didn't mention is the family was home while he was doing this, found the dude in the shower, called the police, and screamed at him to leave. Mundy, naked, just chillax walked out the front door, sipping on his Gatorade, sat down in a rocking chair, and just waited for the cops. Police stated that he was wanted for questioning in a different crime and asked him to bear witness. And with that, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney. And this is the Bad News Network. Our news is at least as bad as the news you're getting already, and the great thing about this Cold War is we get Russian bad guys again. Yeehaw!